All right, welcome everyone to the webinar, Four Steps to Secure Your CID, CICD Pipeline with Bulk. My name is Mark Levy, and I'll be hosting today's webinar, and I focus on product marketing here at OpsMX. First, uh, a few housekeeping items. Today's session's about 50 minutes long. We're recording the session. Uh, we'll send the recording the slides to anyone who requests them. Please ask questions. Bob loves taking questions. Uh, ask the questions in the chat. We'll answer as many questions as we can. Just a little bit about OpsMX. Um, we are dedicated to making the process of continuous delivery easy and successful for all of you. We have a large number of customers of every size from the most sophisticated, including Salesforce and Cisco to organizations who are now highly successful, even though they had little or no continuous delivery experience before we started working with them. What we'd like to do is let's take a quick poll uh, to see where you are with your continuous delivery journey. Um, and while you fill that out, and I please fill it out, I appreciate it. I'd like to um, take a moment to introduce uh, our presenter today, Bob Boulay. Bob is a uh, technology enthusiast with a passion for technology and making things work along with the knack of helping others understand how things work. He has almost 20 years of experience in sales engineering experience. He's known for his dynamic and interactive Spinnaker and CICD presentations. I'm sure you'll agree once you finish uh, with today's presentation. Bob, how are you doing this morning? I'm hanging in there, Mark. Th thank you for that very generous uh, introduction. Uh, I really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully I can live up to the billing. Well, great. Why don't you go ahead and uh, and um, jump right in? Off. All right, all right, guys. So, um, guys, I think um, you know what we're going to talk about today is is a uh, it's a relatively sensitive subject, right? And and I think um, you know a lot of us face uh, these issues, or if not, we have you know security helping us face these issues as we go through and you know sort of plan our application deployment strategies and, and that is you know sort of managing uh credentials and managing um you know keys and secrets um you know and, and ultimately those things they have to be part of your application delivery process and so what i wanted to talk to you a little bit about today and you know i think um uh the reason i'm i'm, I'm we, we chose vault as part of this is ultimately um you know vault is the um the 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 technology that we're leveraging right now, uh, and you know, obviously, Spinnaker uh, also has a, a heavy investment in, in Vault, and you know, we wanted to make sure that we were able to go ahead and actually walk you through some of the key concepts. Now, there's a couple of things I want to I want to get out of the way here as far as far as this presentation goes. Today, um, we're going to be talking a lot of concepts and sort of how things work. So, typically, my presentations involve you know, sort of a, an outline of the material and then. Um, some conceptual stuff, and then and then a demo-ish type of scenario. Today we're gonna we're gonna skip the demo-ish type of stuff, and we're gonna stick with the sort of concepts and the how and the why, right? And but I do want to offer to those folks that have come uh, today, you know, this this is one of those really sensitive topics, and so if you're interested in you know either meeting with myself or one of my solution architect colleagues here at OpsMX to sort of talk about how to manage this and sort of how to go about managing it. If there's questions that you have about it that maybe you're not, you're not, you know, sort of keen on asking in a public forum, um, we'd be happy to uh, to meet with you, whether that be, you know, sort of under NDA or, or just sort of a casual conversation to sort of talk or extend this discussion. So I wanted to put that out there to our audience um, just to make sure that you all knew that, um, you know, we take security very seriously. We take privacy very seriously. And I want to make sure that, um, um, you know, if you if you're interested in doing more hands on keyboard, we're willing to do that in, in a more of a private setting. So um, this is going to sound strange, but I always like to define the obvious at the outset of my presentation. So what is vault? Right. And so, you know, ultimately, you know, um, vault is is that is that technology that is going to help you manage secrets. Right. So the things that you don't want exposed in a configuration file that you don't want exposed in a um, an example, a Helm chart, things that you don't want exposed um, in a system where folks that have access to that system shouldn't have 
access to those those types of scenarios. And um, you know, I think you know, storing that sensitive data without losing the functionality of it being available for automation purposes, right? And so, uh, one of the, the the scenarios that I'll, I'll walk through today is around, you know, sort of how do I protect those things in a, you know, sort of dev, um, you know, wanting to deploy a manifest, um, you know, and ultimately, you know, how do we make sure that they don't have access to, you know, that sensitive information? It's just really all about making sure that people have access to the information they need to do their jobs and not gratuitous ask access to things that they don't need to do their jobs. Uh, and so Vault really does, you know, sort of, uh, you know, sort of fill that need from a technology perspective. And, you know, again, you could fill in, uh, you know, Vault with things like CyberArk or some of the other, you know, sort of secret management pieces that are out there. Uh, we just happen to, uh, and the Spinnaker community happens to like Vault uh, from HashiCorp, uh, and so we wanted to, you know, sort of put it in that context. Um, you know, cases where I need Vault to secure CD process, and, and guys, there are a lot of them. And, and you know, given the fact that we're time constrained here, I had to pick some to sort of talk about today. Um, you know, managing external accounts. So if, if you're, you know, wanting to, uh, if you're using Spinnaker and you want to go ahead and manage cloud provider accounts, um, you know, you want to be able to do that. That's obviously the 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 low hanging fruit there, right? Um, you don't want to make these things available, um, you know, to to anybody that might have, as an example, access to you know the uh, the Spinnaker system, the underlying Spinnaker system. Just because they have access to that doesn't mean they should have access to those cloud provider accounts. Uh, things like ingesting secrets into into Spinnaker pods, um, you know, and and ultimately being able to inject uh, you know uh, secrets into pods in general. Uh, and then, you know, doing things like deploying manifests to multiple accounts. How can I do that with annotations and ultimately, um, you know, make sure that, you know, for each, you know, sort of environment, there may be a different set of secrets. But, you know, there's also other other examples that are going to be part of my presentation. You know, when I start thinking about this and thinking about things like, hey, I want to obfuscate, um, you know, the password or the secret for my CI server. I want to obfuscate, you know, uh, if I'm using something like Google PubSub. I don't need to expose those things in, 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 you know, in sort of a configuration file. Uh, and so I can use, you know, Vault as a configuration server on the back end to make sure that I can call these things, but the content of those secrets is limited to, let's say, a service account um, and maybe, you know, a, a, the folks or the users that need to have access to it. So, um, you know, the security in this context is paramount. We need to make sure that we're protecting these accounts. Um, you know, we, we, we've had so many conversations with customers um, who also are very, very security conscious, right? And, and this is you know, something that they're very concerned with because, you know, again, just because you have access to the system that is doing CD and that's orchestrating your CD doesn't mean that you should have the, the same level of access to the resources that that CD system needs to have and have access to. And so this is really something that is a, uh, uh, a very critical part of the CD process. And ultimately, a lot of our customers, they walk the line here um, around, you know, sort of how do I make sure that, uh, you know, I'm creating that wall between, you know, sort of the folks that need to, to be able to deploy software and the credentials that are required in order to do those deployments. Uh, and so that's really where I think, you know, the, the use cases are derived from. Um, and so, you know, and again, you know, why is uh, this important? Again, I think, you know, it goes back to, you know, the tight control of resource credentials, right? So again, um, you know, just because somebody has to interact with that system doesn't mean they, they should have access to, or, you know, the, the level of access that Spinnaker has to your cloud services, uh, they shouldn't have that, right? Uh, we want to provide seamless deployments while maintaining separation of duties, right? So, um, you know, I want the developer to be able to go ahead and actually complete a manifest, uh, putting information in there that's going to ensure a successful deployment, but they don't need to have access to the service account information, nor should they, right? Uh, and so, again, locking those pieces down. Um, you know, ensuring compliance with SOC 2 and Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, you know, around, you know, sort of control of these passwords and control of those separation of duties and making sure that there isn't a path for a single bad actor uh, to ultimately be able to do a lot of damage uh, by making sure those checks and balances are in there. Um, avoid hard coding credential of credentials, right? I mean, this is something that I think, again, um, most people, when I, when, I, when I give this talk, they chuckle 
right? Um, and, and I chuckle too, right? But it's amazing how much that still happens out there, right? It's, and it's, it's not with any nefarious intentions, um, but, you know, somebody is, you know, working hard to get something to work. And then, you know, they just find themselves doing this and, and ultimately, um, you know, exposing something that then results in a reset having to happen. And then, you know, uh, you know obviously the, the ripple down effect that that, 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 uh, that causes. Um, you know, avoid, you know, exposing credentials and configuration files. And again, this is another place where, um, you know, uh, I want to make sure that that you know um, um, you know when, when I go through my my halyard configuration as an example um, that I'm not you know simply going down the path of you know filling in username and password into a file that you know um, is exposed to other users right uh, who shouldn't necessarily have that information and then of course you know it's just security best practice guys right I mean I think the more security best practices we can bake into our CD process the better off we are the less visits we're going to get from uh, our security friends, right? Uh, these guys, they, they have a thankless job, right? They have to ensure that level of security where we have to ensure things just work. And, you know, we want to reduce that attack surface. We want to make sure that, that you know, in the event that uh, something does happen or something is breached, that, you know, the security team can rest assured that they have a complete list of the folks that had access to those credentials. Um, and it wasn't, you know, some rogue situation where somebody was able to log in and you know even if they didn't do it just the fact that they logged in and suddenly now they have the, the credentials it creates problems and again these are these are things around security guys that i think are well known um but i, I like to as part of this talk you know sort of revisit it so let's take a closer look at some of the use cases and here guys i, I want to again at a high level and, and at a conceptual level walk through sort of these things right and sort of some of the different scenarios um you know i think that um uh, as a the offer that i made earlier in, in the presentation you know if you want to go and do code labs or if you want to get down to hey this is my scenario how would it best work uh we'd be happy to bring resources to bear or do one-on-ones uh that don't force you to sort of ask those types of questions in a public forum but also give us a chance to help you work through a scenario um, you know, hands on. And so we'd be happy to do that. But for now, let's start taking a closer look at some of these use cases. So, you know, um, protect, protecting credentials during dev and deploy, right? So, I mean, of, of course, um, you know, when we start looking at this and, and you know, start looking at, um, you know, that scenario in, in Kubernetes where I may be um, going through the process of releasing, you know, uh, or looking to push a manifest to deploy to production, um, you know, I need to be able to, you know, uh, ultimately provide the information in that manifest that's going to allow for that to run. And so, you know, obviously, when we look at, you know, um, manifest only references and auth token secrets, um, you know, the dev doesn't have to know the content, nor should they know the content uh, of that, they just need to know how to define that that where that secret lives inside of vault uh and then ultimately you know vault will ultimately you know serve as uh the resolution to that set of credentials that are required or that that could config file that's required and so again you know when we start looking at this um you know and and, and that vault token along with a policy around that token to make sure that as an example um only the the service account has the ability to go ahead and access those secrets um, that allow us to sort of create that scenario. And, you know, it, it eliminates, again, you know, when we start talking about separation of duties and sort of making sure that we're maintaining uh, a blast radius around a bad actor, um, you know, being able to go ahead and actually put a wall up like this that doesn't impede the developer, but, you know, allows us to protect uh, those credentials. And, you know, obviously there are going to be some ops and admin folks who have access to that via, you know, the vault server, but, you know, those folks are intended to have access. Uh, and so ultimately we want to make sure that we're doing that. And, and I think, you know, um, I started with this only because this is sort of a, um, you know, sort of a recap of, you know, what's the point here? What are we trying to accomplish? And it's really about, again, protecting those critical credentials, making sure that people only have the level of access that they're supposed to um, and that they don't that we don't wind up with access leakage through hey I need to be able like I can't I can't release this software I can't you know deploy this manifest without this information 
Um, well, you can, right? I mean, all you need to know is sort of how to call out the secret, uh, but you don't need access to the, the data that's associated with that secret. So um, that's really where I want to make sure that we are, you know, sort of setting that stage as this is going to, you know, sort of set the stage for the rest of the use cases. So one of the things that, um, and I, I put a link to a code lab that uh, one of our engineers did, um, but, you know, one of the one of the use cases here is around dynamic accounts and, you know, Kubernetes dynamic accounts in particular. And, you know, sort of ultimately, um, you know, one of the challenges here is, you know, I want to make sure that, you know, within the Spinnaker context, um, you know, as I'm adding new um, uh clusters, you know, as a, you know, obviously Spinnaker is living in its own cluster, but, you know, to be able to target other clusters in my environment, um, you know, the idea behind Spinnaker, it's, you know, obviously multifaceted, multi-targeted um, deployments. And so I may have, you know, a, a test and dev cluster. I may have a, a QA cluster, a staging cluster, uh, multiple production clusters, depending on the scenario. Um, I want to make sure that, that again, I can leverage those things Without exposing, um, you know, some of that 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 you know access information uh, through Spinnaker, right? Again, just because I have access to Spinnaker's back end and just because I have access to manage Spinnaker does not necessarily mean I should have access to uh, and the, the the service count level of access to um, you know the 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 things or the, the clusters that I'm deploying to. Um, and so, you know, ultimately when we start looking at this and ultimately using uh, vault to administer. So basically creating that, that config server and ultimately, uh, you know, uh, adding that sidecar to the cloud driver pod so that I can actually pull the kube config files and making sure those kube config files are locked up in vault. Um, you know, we eliminate uh, that potential leakage, right? We eliminate the, the ability, you know, because now vault and the vault administrator can control uh, the scenario in terms of who has access to that, right? And and so now we're just ultimately using those things. And Spinnaker, uh, again, has that nice integration. And that code lab, I, I put the link to that in there. And, and obviously, um, you know, one of our engineers walked through that. And, you know, uh, I could spend a whole webinar just on that alone. Um, but I think um, what I want to do is I want to talk through the use case that surrounds this have you guys take a look at that code lab. And, and then, you know, obviously, you know, the other piece of this, by the way, guys, just in, in the interest of full disclosure, one of the things that we've done is we've started to bake a lot of this into our setup and configuration process, right? So, um, you know, we're going down the path of not only now, um, you know, using agent-based, um, you know, connectivity, but also, you know, uh, securing these things in vault for you. Um, and so, you know, uh, as, a, as a Spinnaker provider, uh, you know, we're taking the approach both in our on-prem and our, within our SaaS product to make sure that we're, we're leveraging Vault uh, to make sure that these things are locked up uh, tight uh, and that, you know, we're not exposing in any, even inadvertently, any of these kube config files to anybody that shouldn't have access to it. And so, uh, but, you know, in your own scenario, if you are, you know, sort of running Spinnaker now and, you know, want to figure out sort of how to do this, I'd highly recommend this code lab. Uh, but obviously, you know, let us know. I mean, I think, you know, part of, um, you know, our value proposition here, and I, I think part of being good stewards of the community is we're happy to sit with you, you know, under no obligation to sort of talk you through how to do these things. Because I think security is one of those subjects where, um, we want to make sure that we are making the benefit of our expertise available, even if you're not a customer of ours, to make sure that you know how to sort of lock these things down, because we want you to be a successful Spinnaker user. So, you know, the result of this ultimately, right, is, you know, uh, when I go down the path of, of creating those dynamic uh, Kubernetes accounts is, you know, I'm locking up uh, all of those target account, that target account information inside of vault. And so I'm not storing kube config inside of a halyard pod uh, directly. I'm ultimately going ahead and actually doing that and allowing cloud driver to access that information uh, through vault or pull that information out through vault. Uh, and again, I think, you know, uh, you know, now I can go ahead and start to add those additional clusters, whether it be a production cluster, a QA cluster, a staging cluster, all of which I'm sure have, you know, sort of 
different when it comes to, to human beings has different levels of access for different people. And, you know, ultimately, if, if these things get exposed by some common platform by Spinnaker, you've essentially flattened out your security. And that's not the, the path we want to take, right? We, want, we don't want these things exposed. And so locking these things up and making sure that you can successfully add uh, these Kubernetes accounts and ultimately use Vault to protect that um, is really something that's key. You know, Spinnaker itself supports uh, a number of different scenarios around uh, dynamic accounts, right? Uh, and, you know, it, it, Vault is the one we're talking about here, but things like S3, Git, you know, depending on, again, the level of security you have around those things um, and sort of, you know, sort of what you're willing to, to sort of do. Um, but I think, you know, using um, you know, Vault as a, as a configuration server on the back end, and ultimately being able to obfuscate these things, uh, while not while not impeding the deployment process, is the win here. Uh, obviously, things like uh, other account examples like GCP pub sub, right? So, you know, if I'm if I'm going to go ahead and use uh, the the Spring config server, uh, ultimately I can go ahead and, and you know ultimately define um, you know this particular piece. Uh, here through Spring Cloud Config Server Vault, right? So I can use Spring, I can configure Spring Config Server to use Vault as a backend, which is ultimately what I'm doing here. And again, uh, this opens up a whole separate set of possibilities here in terms of the types of accounts that you can keep in here uh, and sort of how it can work from a protection perspective. But again, I think, you know, looking at, I just used this GCP PubSub account as an example where I'm going to go ahead and ultimately create. Um, you know, that spring cloud config server uh, and use vault as a back end for that. That again is that open bit there. And again, I get that vault access token and then I create a vault policy that locks down, um, you know, sort of what accounts within Kubernetes can use that access token. Uh, and that's how I sort of control this uh, and ultimately uh, are starting the process of, of, you know, configuring those secrets uh, from that perspective or storing uh, you know, things like this, right? You know, so, uh, you know, the complete configuration for, um, you know, for the pub sub can be stored inside of vault. And so you extract that information and then ultimately push that to vault. Uh, and then ultimately you make reference to that, that secret, um, you know, and ultimately, you know, you, now you're no longer exposing the information that we see here, right? So I'm no longer exposing those things. And again, you know, depending on my, my security model, uh, it may change, right, in terms of who has access to the Spinnaker server, the Spinnaker configuration files. And so ultimately, um, you know, putting this thing in Vault makes sense. And so there's the information that I need to, as an example, push that con particular configuration file um, over to Vault. Now, you know, the other piece of this, too, is, you know, um, you know, when I want to store configuration information for Spinnaker usage, right? So, um, you know, this here is an example of, you know, sort of how to call um, a secret uh, for things like uh, Jenkins, right? I don't want to publish my Jenkins uh, password in a configuration file or in a Git repo, right? Um, I want to make sure that I can use, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the spring property placeholders to reference the secret values and ultimately go ahead and actually add those secrets to vault yet, you know, because I, I think, you know, one of the things that we'd all agree on here is that um, Spinnaker as an orchestrator is really needing access to a lot of the different tools in your tool chain, right? It's going to orchestrate CI. It's going to orchestrate uh, potentially, uh, uh, you know, your, your source code control. Uh, it's going to orchestrate, you know, things like um, your, uh, uh, artifact repositories. Uh, and then it obviously, you know, sort of left of that, it needs access to, you know, a bunch of other information in order to do its work. And again, this goes back to using Vault to control what people can see. Now, as a, as a, as a Spinnaker administrator, um, you know, I sort of know what those values need to be from a, uh, from a Vault perspective in terms of using things like the property placeholders uh, for Spring. But you know, I don't need to know what the uh, that secret contains, right? Uh, and and ultimately, you know, like I said, the vault administrator uh, with the right set of policies can sort of maintain the fact that I can actually call this uh, and not expose that secret. So again, uh, another area, you know, sort of in that Spinnaker world where I want to make sure I'm obfuscating 
um, the scenarios or I'm obfuscating, um, you know, the, the, the passwords or the credentials that I need or the system needs in order to do its job uh, without exposing them to folks that just simply don't need access to that. And obviously, you know, again, you know, you, you, there's no reason for, um, you know, or potentially any real reason for, um, you know, the Spinnaker administrator to be able to access, you know, let's say a Jenkins type of service account, you know, where, you know, this is what Spinnaker needs in order to do its job, but that's a different level of access than what this Spinnaker administrator should have. And so we don't want to expose those things. So uh, the other piece to this too is, is really around, you know, um, injecting secrets into, into pods, right? And, and of course, you know, this gets into, this, this is a, this is actually, I won't do this justice from a technical perspective here because it just simply isn't enough time. But this is something that I would encourage you to reach out to us on. There's also, uh, I'm gonna talk to Mark about making sure that there was a blog post written by one of our engineers around this as well, that I think is really effective. But the idea behind this is to use the Spinnaker agent uh, to be able to inject, um, secrets into po running pods, right? And I think, you know, uh, by going down the path of storing those secrets, doing sort of a lot of the same things you would normally do, right? Setting up vault, being able to go through the process of making sure that you have um, that vault policy that controls access to who or what can see the contents of these secrets. Uh, obviously, you don't want uh, something outside of, you know, maybe a service account from from an automation perspective to have access to that. And then ultimately, you know, installing, uh, deploying a manifest that's gonna ultimately deploy that vault agent or that sidecar, uh, which will act as the agent to go ahead and actually retrieve or synchronize these things. And this does uh, a, a few different things. You know, obviously um, credentials in a good security scenario are gonna be dynamic, right? They're, they're not gonna be static for long periods of time or forever. Right. I mean, even if it's somewhat something like a, a potential breach forces a change, um, those things are going to be uh, are not going to always be static. And so one of the things that you want to set up is you want to set up a scenario where when that that credential is updated in vault, that it makes its way to those various pods uh, that require access to those specific secrets. And so, again, I think, you know, making sure that you can do that, um, you know, and, and obviously that's accomplished by using. Um, you know, sort of a normal sort of vault setup, but then ultimately adding some annotations to your pod deployments uh, that will ultimately, you know, go ahead and actually uh, deploy or, or access to that agent or that sidecar, um, ultimately, you know, defining the role. So there'll be a role there that's defined in, in, in vault that, you know, ultimately will give this particular um, uh, pod access. And then ultimately, you know, defining the specific secrets, right? So, so making sure that you can define those specific secrets. And, you know, so as you go down the path of doing that and making sure that you're running like this, uh, those pods will consistently have access to the secrets that they need in order to do their jobs. Uh, and it won't be a situation where if you make a change in vault to that, 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 uh, that set of credentials, um, that you're going to break a bunch of things, right? This is a way to make sure that uh, you can make those changes without worrying about a lot of breakage. Now, again, this is something that, you know, frankly, um, you know, there's, there's a fair amount of setup to do here. Uh, we do have a really nice code lab slash blog post that was written by one of our engineers that really sort of takes you through this. But this is also one of those things where, um, you know, we have a series of security experts that are on staff here at OpsMX. And, you know, if you want to talk about a thing or you're thinking about doing this, you know, security is one of those things, guys, where um, it transcends, you know, sort of any commercial relationships. If we can help people, you know, make sure that they're doing things securely, we're more than willing to sort of step up to the plate and, and sort of, um, you know, sort of help out with resources and make sure that we're helping people specifically understand sort of how these things work uh, to make sure that they can ultimately deploy in a way that is conducive to, you know, what we might call a, a you know, sort of safe model uh, where you're not, you know, sort of, and, and, you know, the worst thing about it is, is that, you know, if, if you're going to do this, you may as well do it right. And we want to make sure that uh, these things get done correctly. And so that's, Again, I know this is high level guys, and you know, I, I, I wanted to make sure I warned you at the outset, um, the level of detail we're happy to get into, but I think you know, we wanna make sure that as you go through a mental checklist about how you're sort of doing this, um, make sure that you've, you've you know, ultimately are looking at these things and saying, hey, you know, um, this is great, 
you know, I understand now the areas I need to be looking. Ooh. All right. So guys, this is uh, a little shorter um, than I think uh, past webinars. But again, I think I've kept it fairly high level. Uh, and I also wanted to make sure that uh, I left some time for questions. And again, those questions, if I can't answer them, because, you know, I'll also be honest with you guys, I am, while I'm a uh, well-versed in Kubernetes and well-versed in, in, you know, sort of the use of, of things like Vault. I'm not a security expert. Uh, we have those on staff. Uh, we have several of those on staff. Um, so I want to go ahead and field any questions that you might have. Uh, and ultimately, if I can't answer them or if I don't know the answer to them, uh, you know, make sure we, we get you for some follow-up. Um, Mark, uh, let me turn it back over to you and see if maybe uh, there are any questions in the queue. Great, Bob. Yeah, thank you. And of course, uh... Very important topic. If you have any questions, please enter them in the chat. You know, Bob, I was thinking, um, so how, do, you know, interesting sort of how um, these tool chains sort of integrate, especially if there's, a, you know, sort of the combination of on-prem and, and cloud, uh, you know, um, instances of, of various tools. I, I'm sort of thinking about our ops, um, MX Intelligent Cloud offering, which is a SaaS offering, how would a, a customer, you know, manage uh, secrets? So let's say maybe they had, uh, you know, vault on prem. You know, how how would that work? Can you sort of give so, an so, that? yeah, so there's a couple of options there, right? And and you know, one of the things that I will say um, is that you know we uh, internally and in our SaaS instances are actually protecting any secrets that are required to be added um, in vault as well. And what most of our customers will do is there's a couple of different options here in terms of, you know, using our agent to get connectivity behind your firewall to, you know, sort of vault that, you know, gives uh, some security folks uh, a little bit of heartburn. Most of the time, what our customers who are looking to use our SaaS offering, they'll vet, you know, sort of how we're storing things like secrets, right? Uh, because they obviously you need to at some level give that SaaS instance some of that access. Now, We've solved some of that problem with a combination of Vault and uh, our Kubernetes agent so that I can actually deploy an agent and actually secure the communication directly. So the agent actually acts as a proxy. The agent actually is deployed uh, by someone on your, your side. So that target cluster, uh, they take that, that agent manifest and it creates the service account locally. And ultimately that agent acts as a proxy inside of that Kubernetes cluster so that all um, Spinnaker needs to do is actually talk to that agent. It doesn't need to, um, you know, have access to any of those credentials. It just issues those commands. And because that agent's acting as a proxy, uh, we don't need um, the access to those, those, those credentials there. And so that's one of the things we do. But I think for other things, Mark, we are, um, you know, what we usually tell our customers is go out and, and, and set up a, a set of accounts for a SaaS instance of a CD tool, uh, like our, our intelligent cloud offering. Uh, and then, you know, know that what we're doing on the back end is ultimately storing those things in vault so that there's nobody that can get access to that information from our side. Um, and there's nobody that, you know, if, if, if the instance were to become compromised, uh, that they would see any of that information in, uh, you know, a configuration file, like a HAL config file or, um, you know, any of those types of scenarios. So we take that level of security very seriously by implementing Vault on our side, along with a, a bunch of other obvious security measures that, um, you know, we're not really willing to talk about just because we don't want to, we don't want to compromise them. But I think that, you know, um, that combination has made our SaaS, our intelligent cloud, extremely secure. Yeah, great, good, and pretty interesting of how it works. The other, other uh, it, insight, perhaps maybe you you have or can comment on. I'm just curious on um, how Vault, you know, so Vault um, is taking credentials that would possibly normally be stored in like GitHub, as as an example, right? Well. Um, Never store credentials in no, GitHub. Never. Secrets, <laughs> uh, but, right? but, but yeah, but, but yeah, so, so yeah. So anything that, so if you think about Spinnaker, and I think I know where you're going here is, is how do we, it, it's, it's essentially managing credentials that have to live somewhere, right? Is that what you're, you're essentially yeah, saying? Yeah, I am. I'm that, but plus also how, how does Vault play sort of in the whole GetOps 
ecosystem. Yeah. And so I think it's, 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 it plays a, a huge role because look, I mean, you know, when you're talking about GitOps and you're talking about, you know, being able to sort of move code from uh, source to prod very, very quickly. Um, and, you know, you're dealing with credentials, whether that be, you know, sort of tools in the tool chain that your CD tool has to interact with, or if you're talking about, you know, sort of publishing a manifest where, or writing a, and deploying a manifest where, you know, um, you need to be able to have access or, or confirm access to that target cluster. Again, it goes back to, you know, the developer doesn't necessarily need service account access to the cluster that's being deployed to, but they still need to be able to, to sort of write the manifest to be able to deploy it and being able to go ahead and actually obfuscate that information. So all they need to know is, you know, the path to a secret or the, 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 the identifier for that secret that's living inside of vault. And if you've configured your CD tool to use vault as that config server, uh, it's going to go ahead and actually access that through the service account um, or whatever policy the vault administrator has set up. Um, so it's that separation of duties, right? So it, it wow. really empowers the the developer by making it faster and limiting their need to have you know um, access beyond what's required to do their job, right? And I think that's really where this helps streamline that whole process. And it, it, it creates a pull. It pulls from Vault, you know. That's right. Just like that's right. And so and so the human being, the individual developer, doesn't need to know. They just need to know what secret it is, and then Vault will resolve it. Um, or it will get resolved via Vault um, as that backend config server. And, um, you know, the human being doesn't need to see it. Um, you know, and again, if the Vault administrator has created the right policies and restricted those policies to, let's say, um, you know, the Kubernetes service account for, uh, for, for Spinnaker in this case, right, uh, then there aren't human beings that, that would be able to see it, right? It's just going to be call that secret get the information that you need and then ultimately do your deployment. And so you eliminate, um, again, that potential, you know, sort of leakage it, it, that's inadvertent and, you know, not nefarious, but could be used for nefarious purposes. Super. Well, great. Thank you. Really good, insightful sort of level set. Um, any other final questions before we wrap up? We really appreciate the time, everybody, for the day. And if you do have questions or like Bob mentioned, Bob extended a, you know, uh, a session. If you want to talk to us, info at opsmx.com. Contact, contact Bob directly. I'm sure he'd love to talk to you if you really want to dive into more uh, how to integrate Spinnaker with Vault, Kubernetes. He's, he's an expert at it. Yeah, so guys, I'd be happy to bring our experts too. So, you know, there's uh, there's some colleagues of mine that that do nothing but security work here and uh, be happy to bring them too. We take security very seriously. And and, and Mark, I think, you know, um, you'd agree here in, in the time uh, we've, we've spent together here at OpsMX, this is something that's cultural for us, right? We want to make sure that um, we don't try, we're not, we don't try and generate commercial relationships based on office security. We want to make sure you can get it right. Uh, and so if you need that level of help, and, you know, rather than Google it, uh, just drop us a line and let us give you a hand. Yeah, super. Well, great. Thank you so much, Bob, for your time as well. I want to thank everybody for theirs. There will be, we'll send out the slides in the recording. And with that, I want to wish everybody a great day. Until next time, we'll see you later. Thank you. Take care, all. Thank you.